Hi there. Let's talk about Plotinus and the Divine Mind. I'm Eric Steinhardt. You can learn more about me and my work at www.ericsteinhardt.com. Here's Plotinus. He talks about the Divine Mind. What is the Divine Mind? We can approach the Divine Mind by thinking about structures. Let's start with a simple structure of a cross. Uh, two lines crossing each other, and we'll make crosses in crosses by crossing the lines. We cross them again. We cross them again. We're down to one, two, three levels of crossing, a fourth level of crossing. And you'll notice that this pattern has self-similarity. The uh, part that is circled in red is similar to the whole that is circled in blue. This is self-similarity. It's finite self-similarity because we're only talking about finite structures and it's only approximate. Each branch of, branch of the cross depicts the whole cross at one less level of detail. If the cross is nested four deep, then each branch depicts a cross nested only three deep. Do self-similar things like this physically exist or are they just abstractions? Well, there are holograms. Holograms have self-similarity. Here's an example. If we made a hologram with a star, then when we cut the hologram in half, remarkably, the star will appear, the whole image of the star will appear in each half. The entire image of the star is encoded in every part of the hologram. Likewise, if we cut that half into half again, so now we have quarters, we'll have the entire image of the star reproduced again in each of those quarter parts. And you can actually see this. This was a hologram of a little cubical thing that was broken in half, and you can see that each part is repeated. Now, since these are still only finitely complex objects, each partial image, right, each image encoded in the part, is encoded at a lower resolution than the whole. So if you keep chopping it up, eventually it'll just get to a kind of noisy blur. Nevertheless, a hologram does include the does encode the structure of the whole in each part. The self-similarity. A structure is self-similar means that a part of the structure represents the whole structure. Self-similarity is self-representation. Part of the structure represents the whole structure. And self-similarity relates to self-consciousness. An idea in the mind represents the entire mind. If a mind is self-conscious, it has to have an idea of itself. And if it were perfectly self-conscious, its idea of itself would be exactly the same as itself. Now we get back to Plotinus and talking about the divine mind, and the divine mind is holographic, and Plotinus, of course, doesn't know about holograms, but he understands the property of a part representing the whole in its entirety, having the exact same structure or being isomorphic to the whole, and he describes that in the Aeneids in several places. Then the ideas in the divine mind resemble hieroglyphic or ideographic images, Plotinus says. <clears throat> And he says that each idea in the divine mind, quote, has everything in itself and sees all things in every other, so that all are everywhere and each and every one is all. That's holographic language, sometimes called holenmerism, meaning that the whole is completely present in every part. Integral omnipresence is another phrase that's used to translate the Platinian idea. Let's modernize this a little bit. Self-representation. Here's Josiah Royce on the left, an American philosopher in the early part of the 20th century. And he defines something called the Royce map. It's a perfect map of England within England. It's an exactly self-representative structure. And you can see exactly what this is going to be like. If England just has, let's say, two roads, that's the map at level zero. What if we take the um, southeastern part of England and we make a map of England in that southeastern part? Well, those are the two roads in M1. But of course, the map, if it totally represents England, has to represent the fact that it contains the map. So we have to put that in the lower corner, lower right-hand corner, the uh, southeastern corner in map two. And we have to continue because now we've got a map inside a map, and that has to be represented in the map, and we get map three. Of course, this is going to be an infinitely complex structure. If the map exactly represents England, then the map is infinitely detailed, infinitely self-nested, infinitely self-mirroring, and infinitely self-representing. The Royce map is exactly self-representative. If it were only finitely deeply nested, then it would be only approximately self-representative. So it cannot be finitely complex. The Royce map is indeed infinitely complex. 
And Plotinus says the same thing about the divine mind. The divine mind is perfectly self-representative, and the divine mind is infinitely complex. It is an infinitely detailed, self-describing hologram. Infinity. That's key to understanding the divine mind. We don't represent infinity as something that goes on forever in any modern sense. Infinity, that little omega, is the set of all finite numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on, the counting numbers or the whole numbers. We use set theory to talk about infinity. Now look at the infinite number line, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. It's self-similar as well. Look at the red numbers and the blue numbers. The red numbers are the evens, the blue numbers are the odds. You can pull them out to parts of the number line, and each one of those parts exactly represents the whole, and it's infinite in its self-representation. The even numbers represent the whole because you can just define the successor of an even number as the next even number. The odd numbers represent the whole. The successor of any odd number is the next odd number. And either one of those parts can completely stand in for the numbers. You can do arithmetic on either of the subparts as if it were the whole, just by simple translation. And so infinity, the infinity of the number line, is holographic. Back to Plotinus, the divine mind is infinitely complex. He says this in many places in the Aeneids. But what is the content of this infinite complexity? What are the thoughts of the divine mind? For this, let's look at some iterated things. We're going to start with an iterated body plan. This is like what Hans Moravec talks about in his book Mind Children, kind of a bush robot. It's got several iterations of this bow plan or body plan. We've got a trunk, then we've got two arms and two legs. We've got some uh, hands or feet coming off and some fingers on L3. And if we iterate this to infinity, 0, 1, 2, 3, so on, all the way to infinity, what do we get? Well, we're going to have this nested iteration uh, at infinity, the, the level in infinite. You can see the kind of gray triangles because we're going to get lost in the detail. I can't draw it all. But it'll be an infinitely deeply nested and detailed body plan like Royce's self-representing map. There's a fanciful image of a hand, right, iterated hand, right, hands on hands on hands, hand on a hand on a hand, three levels deep. That's only finite. Imagine if that went on infinitely. Let's look at this again with iterated limbs now. Let's have the form of a cross again. We've got a body in the center with four, four limbs radiating out. They have limbs on limbs, limbs on limbs, on limbs, limbs on limbs, on limbs, on limbs. And in fact, this occurs in nature, in the basket starfish. It's only finite, but you get the idea. And basket starfishes could be iterated to infinity. Uh, and again, let me recommend Hans Moravec's book, Mind Children, for his bush robots. Here's the Sierpinski triangle, another example of iteration and self-representation. We have the triangle on the left, you put a triangle inside it, triangle inside those, triangles inside triangles inside triangles, and this can be iterated to infinity. There can be an infinitely detailed triangle which is absolutely self-representative. Each of its parts has the exact same structure as the whole. Here it is in three dimensions, the Sierpinski pyramid, right, and it's a complementary pyramid in blue, and you can see that those are, uh, that pattern could be infinitely self-nested and infinitely self-iterated. Here's the Menger sponge, uh, level zero, then level one, then level two, then three deep. Again, that can be infinitely nested. Uh, there's a, a larger example of it, the Menger cube, right, with the parts cut out, and you can keep cutting it out. You can keep drilling out, uh, removing the central uh, core of each subcube to make an infinitely detailed fractal. And these are fractals. They are self-similar geometrical objects. You can do it with pentagons. Here is a kind of pentagonal uh, Menger sponge where we've cut out pentagons. Um, and you can uh, curve or the, you know, the edges of the pentagons. You get something that really looks like an infinite sponge, a fractal sponge. And these can make kind of alien fractal animals, right? These these things that have strange body plans that could go on to infinite detail uh, if we could draw them that way. And these kinds of things, again, they do occur in nature. Here's fractal broccoli that looks a bit like some of those previous images. This is a mandel bulb, right? That's a, an image of the Mandelbrot set that we'll mention later. It looks like a strange little creature, some sort of plankton or something from, from the sea. Uh, here's a Barnsley fern. You can see that this is a fractal structure. It's self-similar. Each subpart of the fern uh, is similar to the whole fern, and there you can see the similarity, right? The similarity of the red or the dark blue is um, similar to the light blue. Each of the parts is similar to the whole, and that similarity gets self-nested. And of course, you can make these structures, these self-similar fractal structures, three-dimensional. 
Uh, there's more fractal trees for you right there. These are dragon cur trees based on the fractal dragon curve. Here they can be um, really deeply, richly detailed in depth, and this this could be infinitely detailed. This is a kind of uh, you know fractal set that can be infinitely richly detailed. Uh, sort of the tip of a fern, or perhaps an octopus, an infinitely detailed octopus arm, or perhaps a finger of some kind. They can be fractal organisms with, with strange kinds of infinitely detailed and nested uh, organs, skins, or lungs, or brains. Uh, they can look very biological, these fractal, infinitely detailed fractal organisms. And they could be just strange alien organisms, infinitely rich and infinitely detailed. Back to Plotinus. What are the thoughts of the divine mind? The divine mind thinks of all infinitely complex fractal structures. It takes every possible perspective on itself. Royce thought of this in terms of the number line being mapped onto itself in all possible ways. We don't need to get into that right now. But every perspective of the divine mind on itself is a different way that infinite complexity regards itself. And it's a different way that infinite complexity represents itself to itself. Each perspective is a different, infinitely detailed fractal object. Here's the Mandelbrot set that was mentioned a little bit earlier. That's a, an infinitely detailed fractal object, and you can see its kind of patterns of self-similarity, all those self-similar spirals. There are plenty of beautiful, in-depth, right, you're going into deeper and deeper magnifications into the Mandelbrot set. It's a continuous set, right? You can zoom into it to infinity, and you just get these endlessly repeating, but nevertheless different images. And the Mandelbrot set's a good little proximate icon for the divine mind. Back to Plotinus, he says every part of the divine mind is an infinite divine mind exactly like the whole divine mind. That's infinity, that's infinite self-representation, the part represents the whole from different perspectives and yet they can be translated into each other. Plotinus depicts the divine mind as a globe of faces radiant with all faces living. I mean, what might that look like? Something like this, but that's not really accurate, right? You would have to have the faces kind of blended into each other, each face containing infinitely nested fractal faces. So Plotinus says there's a divine mind, but why only one divine mind? Infinite minds contain infinitely many infinite subminds, all of which would be equally divine since they're infinitely they're equally infinite. And so if you think that this is the one biggest divine mind, the one maximally inclusive divine mind, then in fact you've only picked out a submind of some bigger divine mind. So there must be infinitely many infinite minds. John Leslie argues for an infinity of infinite divine minds in his book, appropriately titled Infinite Minds. And if there are infinite divine minds, then there would be many of them. I just used some faces to represent them, since that was a Platinian image of faces within faces. There might be one that sort of looks like this, or one that looks like this. They don't have to be like us. They would be very, very strange minds. And again, they might not have faces in any recognizable sense at all, any sense recognizable to us. This is a kind of infinite fractal mind that thinks what it thinks. It's so far beyond humanity. It so far transcends anything like consciousness or self-consciousness that we know. I'm Eric Steinhardt. You can learn more about me at ericsteinhardt.com. Thank you very much.